Our webinar today will run for approximately 45 minutes, starting with a brief intro into the Akamai developer ecosystem and best practices, then jump into a series of demos that will give you a real look into how our experts set up their development environments. After the demos, we will have a brief quiz where you can compete with fellow attendees on what we have presented today. The top three winners will get a prize sent to their email inbox. Lastly, we will end the webinar with a Q&A session. Please feel welcome to leave questions in the Q&A box on the left, and our behind-the-scenes speakers and moderators will answer them there or live. We want to make sure this content and format is what you, Akamai developers, would like to see. So please complete the survey and share your thoughts on how we did, how we can improve, and what you'd like to see next. This is located in the survey icon below to the far right. The presentation, recording, and all code samples from the demos will be sent to you in our follow-up emails. You can also find links for additional learning in our resources section to the right of the screen. Join me in welcoming our speakers for today. Javier Garza, our Senior Developer Advocate based in the SF Bay Area. Lucas Sherpak, our Senior Enterprise Architect located in Krakow, Poland and Anthony Hogg, our senior enterprise architect residing in Paris, France. That said, let's get started on our main topic today, setting up a development environment in five minutes. Javier, we're ready when you are. Thank you, Rachel. Welcome to the Setup a Development Environment in Five Minutes webinar. I'm Javier Garza, Developer Advocate at Akamai Technologies, and today, I will be guiding you through this webinar and how to get started with the Akamai development environment. For those who are not familiar with Akamai, I wanted to say that Akamai is more than a content delivery network, offering solutions for web, API, media, security, IoT, enterprise applications, infrastructure solutions like load balancing and DNS, and many more. Managing all these services have been traditionally done using the Akamai Control Center website, at control.akamai.com. But using a graphical user interface is very time consuming when you have a large number of properties and services with frequent updates. And here is where APIs come into place. Akamai offers a rich library of approximately 100 different APIs. And to help consume those APIs, we offer API authentication plugins for the most popular programming languages. And also a command line interface tool also known as the Akamai CLI, with over 20 different packages that you can use to manage your Akamai solutions as code. The Akamai development environment offers you a simple solution to help you get started faster in the form of a Docker image containing Akamai and third-party command line tools like the Akamai CLI, HTTPy, curl, and Terraform with the corresponding Akamai extensions. In order to use the environment, you need two things. First, to have Docker installed, either in Mac, Windows, or Linux. And second, valid API credentials to authenticate to the Akamai APIs you want to use. Docker containers encapsulate everything an application needs to run, and only those things. And they allow applications to be shuffled easily between environments. For example, I can use the same Docker command to run the Akamai developer environment on a Windows desktop on a MacBook laptop or on a Linux server on the cloud. Furthermore, thanks to Docker Hub's integration, installing a container is completely transparent. As everything needed will be pulled automatically the first time you execute the Docker run command on a given host. And although as you can see, our Docker image container has a lot of components, it starts under two seconds. Before we jump to the demos, I wanted to let you know that everything you are going to see today was created in just a few hours of efficient collaboration by a very small team that was spread across the globe. Here is a diagram of how we did it in case you are curious. One problem of maintaining Docker containers is that you often have to create new builds whenever one of the components included inside the container updates. We wanted to optimize the process to ensure it will require the least amount of effort from us. So we decided to implement a continuous deployment workflow, which is shown on the screen. Whenever we commit a change on the GitHub master branch, Travis CI will automatically generate a new build, which will then be pushed to Docker Hub, where anybody in the world can download it from. And then Travis CI sends a notification to an internal Slack channel to let people know about it. 
Another thing worth mentioning is that we made a lot of effort to optimize the Docker image so that it ran fast and is as small as possible. Lucas, can you please give us some details on what you did to optimize the Docker image and reduce its size from 2.5 gigabyte to just one? That seems like too good to be true. Absolutely. We spent some time on analyzing what exactly occupies space and is not needed for Akamai CLIs to work. It turned out we had lots of development dependencies in the system as well as inside many of individual CLIs. In order to get rid of system-level dev dependencies, we decided to use multi-stage build in Docker file. In the first stage, we install everything that is needed to build all packages. In the next stage, we start with a clean Alpine image and install generated in the previous stage artifacts. This will require only runtime dependencies to be installed on the system. Also, we figured that some CLIs install dev libraries which are not needed in production environments. We got rid of those by explicitly setting a production flag for each CLI we install inside the image. Other tweaks helping to reduce final size were related to switching from Java Development Kit to Java Runtime Environment. Thanks so much, Lucas, for the details. We created a Docker image with everything we thought people may need for DevOps. But we wanted to take things a step further and create something really small and fast that customers could deploy at a scale on production systems. Anthony had a great idea that allowed us to create a la carte images that are super small. Using this approach, customers could download a Docker image for purging content that was just 8 megabytes. Anthony, can you quickly explain how the Docker image variant works and how customers can use them for automation? Sure. The point of the variants is to make individual utilities available for Docker-friendly environments in an easy way. Maybe you need the property manager CLI, the purge CLI in your pipeline. You should just need to download those bits. This gives you faster images to run with fewer dependencies and a smaller attack surface as well. But the challenge is maintenance. If we have one Docker file for each utility, and we still want to give access to a golden image with all the things, we want to avoid duplication. What's great about Docker is the ability to provide the base image as a build argument. This allows us to chain every component Docker file together to create the golden image with minimal hassle. With clear visibility into the dependencies of each component, it also became easier to zero in on image bloat. As a result, our variants will be much smaller, from 8 megabytes for the DNS or purge CLI images up to maybe 400 or 500 megabytes for the golden image. Merci, Anthony. Wow, and megabytes instead of 1 gigabyte, that is so cool. All right, enough talking, let's see this in action. We are going to start showing you how to set up the development environment, including any prerequisites. Then we are going to see four additional demos showing you how you can leverage the Docker environment to manage different Akamai services using APIs. This demo consists of three things. First, we are going to provision API access. Then we'll install the Docker desktop in our machine and then we will install and run the Akamai development environment. To provision API credentials, we need to log into control.akamai.com with a user that has administrative privileges. Then we open the identity and access application and click new client for me. In the next screen, we are presented with a list of roles we can grant to the API client. By default, we get the same access as the current user. Let's click Next, as we don't want to restrict access for this client right now. The next step is to give the API client a name and provide access to the APIs. We are going to call it API Credentials Demo. Next, we will grant this client access to individual APIs. We are going to follow zero trust best practices and give access to just two APIs for now. The first API is going to be Property Manager, so we are going to search for Property and in Access Level select Read Write, which grants the API client access to endpoints that use POST, PUT and DELETE methods. Let's repeat the same process for the Diagnostics API. We will click on Access Level, select Read Write and click Submit. 
Perfect. So now we have created the API client. The next step we have to do is create a credentials. So we click the new credentials button and here we have. Let's copy this to the clipboard. It's not really needed, but if you want, you can also click the download client tokens and have the credentials saved in a text file in your computer. All right, that's it. Now we have valid credentials and we can start making API calls. Let me switch to the terminal and I'm going to paste the credentials I just copied into a file in my home directory called .hrc. Press enter. I'm going to press I for insert. I'm going to paste the credentials in a default section, which brackets, escape, colon, WQ, and save the file. That's it. I'm going to clear the screen. The next prerequisite is to install the Docker desktop in our local machine. So we are going to open a web browser. Let me switch to my uh, browser. You need to go to docker.com, then look in the page, scroll down until you see Docker Desktop and click the button. And in the next page, you should see a download for your platform. I have a Mac, but you will download it for Windows or Linux or whatever platform you use. That's it, just double click the installer, install it, and ensure that it says Docker Desktop is running. I'm going to switch back to the terminal and paste my docker run command. This will run docker in interactive mode. Name your docker image Akamai and grab the contents from docker hub under Akamai slash Akamai docker. It will go ahead and install all the required tools such as the Akamai CLI and several packages you can use to manage different services. HTTP, Terraform with the Akamai provider, curl and any runtime dependencies such as Python, and its package manager pip, the Java runtime environment, Node.js and NPM, Golang, Git, text editors like Beam and Nano, and so on. As you can see, it took less than five minutes to get the Akamai Docker environment installed on my laptop, but times can vary depending on internet speeds and CPU. Let me type Akamai to show you that we have the CLI pre-installed with many packages already. Okay, let's see some examples on how we can use it now. Most modern websites use a content management system, also known as CMS, to create the web pages. Once author publishes content on the CMS, the operations team needs to purge any earlier versions of the content that have been cached on the content delivery network, also known as CDN. This process happens several times a day, so you will gain operational efficiencies by automating this using the Fast Purge API. There are several ways to use the Fast Purge API. For this demo, we are going to use the Purge CLI package as it does not require us writing any code or preparing the runtime environment when using it with the Docker container. First of all, we need to ensure we have API credentials with permissions to use the Fast Purge API. If we check the help screen of the Purge CLI, I'm going to switch to my other screen where I have split the screen between the terminal and a web browser. For this demo, I'm using an origin server called jgarza.origin.sandbox.akamidevelopper.com we set up in Heroku that just returns the current time of the web server. The hostname delivered by Akamai is jgarza.sandbox.akamidevelopper.com, so without the origin, and as you can see, it resolves to the Akamai staging network. This is something that you don't want to do with a production server, the main reason I did it here is because activations in a staging is much faster than production and that's great for demos. And since my website doesn't have any real traffic, I'm fine with using a much smaller network with less Akamai servers. Let me now switch to the web browser. You can see this is the page and the origin. Let me zoom it in. origin, as you can see. And if I click on the reload button, you can see the timestamp on the screen will update. So 22.47, let me reload again, 22.53, 54, 56, and so on. Now let me go to the Akamai, so I'm going to delete the part origin from the hostname and press enter. And you can see the time is 9.18.48, 
and if I reload the page you can see that nothing happens let me try several more times you can see the page loads very quickly but the timestamp doesn't change and that's because of caching let's switch to the terminal and see how easy it is to use the purge CLI to invalidate the content we just need to type Akamai purge invalidate the network staging and then we copy the URL from the browser to the terminal press enter and it takes around two seconds usually you know to purge the content so you go up, I go back to the screen you can see 1848 I'm going to refresh and it changes to 2346 so the content was refreshed so again if we click reload again it's not going to change because of course it's betting cache again but I can go to the terminal repeat the command and if I reload the browser again 2346 let me click the reload button 2406 so you can see purging with the CLI is fast and easy Akamai also offers additional ways to purge content for example by CP code which allows you to purge for example the whole website and should be used with caution and by cache tag which allows you to purge a group of objects that are tagged by origin with a single value let's see how we would purge by cache tags indicating a tag of fiction books so let me remove the URL I'm going to add minus minus tag fiction dash books and press enter and in two or three seconds the purge happens very easy let's see how easy it is to enforce geofencing on media assets to ensure they can only be viewed in a given country we are going to protect our media assets in four steps we will download the property rules for an existing configuration we'll add the new functionality we'll activate it and we'll verify it works fine okay let me switch to my other screen and you can see on the left side I have my terminal and on the right side I have my Visual Studio code with the commands I'm going to type I went ahead and copied the JSON code needed to implement the geoprotection into the local file let's take a look using the command line utility JQ which will help us validate the JSON and colorize the output let me uncopy the JQ command and paste it on the terminal press enter and here is the config file as you can see basically what we do is um, we deny access if the path matches videos slash nl and the country is not the Netherlands so I'm going to copy the curl command into my terminal to just verify that I can play it from the US you can see I get a 200 OK so the next step now I'm going to download the Akamai property so let me clear my screen I'm going to copy this command that basically what it does copy what it does is it retrieves the configuration file name you can see my configuration name the property version I specify version 27 and I save the file in a file called rules.json let me copy this command to show you the contents of the file I just downloaded from Akamai and you can see this is my configuration and JSON format the next thing I'm going to do I'm going to merge the snippet that I showed you earlier before with this one I just downloaded which is this JQ command let me verify with again with JQ that the merging work fine if it will be an error you know it will complain but everything looks good and I can see the code I added is here yeah everything yep looks good all right so let me do a div just to be safe and ensure that I am only adding new lines and I'm not deleting anything so you can see if I compare the two files I only see the plus which shows I only added the new lines with the new functionality so now I'm going to run the update command and this command what it does is basically takes the JSON file that I just created with the merge uh, code and uploads it into Akamai and you can see it created version 30 it took uh, 13 seconds so the next step is to activate yeah you can see version 30 here I'm going to activate the version in the staging network so I'm going to copy this and you can see it says property activate the name of the configuration and then I indicate the network staging because by default activations are in production so you can see version 30 is activating in the staging 
Activations in staging are pretty fast and usually well under 5 minutes. While we wait for the activation to complete, we are going to see how we can leverage the Diagnostics API to make requests from almost anywhere in the world, which is pretty useful for testing things like geofencing. Let's go to developer.akamai.com slash API and search for Diagnostics. Let's click. This API is great for debugging. Let's search for locations once loads. And we can see the list available ghost locations is there. You can see it's a get method with the endpoint. And this will return a list of all the Akamai servers where I can run API requests. However, I want to filter by the cities of Los Angeles and Amsterdam. So I put it through a JQ command. As you can see here, I'm going to run it. And you can see it returns the IDs of two servers that I can run commands, one in Amsterdam and one in LA. Using the results from before, the Amsterdam Netherlands, I'm going to run a command to basically tell the Akamai server in Amsterdam to request this video. So I'm going to paste it. It should take a few seconds. It basically connects to the server in Amsterdam and tell, give me this 10 megabyte file. And as you can see, it returns at 200, which means the file was fine and you can see the content length is 10 megabytes. Now let's repeat the same from the server in LA. So I'm going to copy this into my terminal and press enter. And if you can see, we get a 403, say forbidden, which means the new configuration already activated and the geofencing is taking place. Protecting websites against SQL injections and many other security attacks have never been easier. Let's see how you can execute an SQL injection attack against a website and how you can easily configure a web firewall at the edge with a few API calls to protect it. Once the web firewall is up, we will try repeating the attack and see what happens. For our origin, we are using a PHP web server called DVWA that is available in GitHub and allows to easily change the security levels of the site and simulate application layer attacks. Let me open the administrative web interface and change the security settings to low so we can see how easy it is to launch an SQL injection attack and dump all the users of our database. I'm going to go to the security and change the security level from impossible to low. Let's click low and click submit. And as you can see, the level is now low. Click on SQL injection and on the user ID, I'm going to paste a special form string to execute an attack. If I click Submit, you can see how I can dump all the users in the database. In my case, I just have five users you know, with sample data. Let me leave this prepared so I can come back and try it out later on after I protect the site. So I'm switching to the terminal now. And you can see here all my commands. Next is to configure the Akamai Web Application Firewall to protect this site against SQL injection attacks. That happens with four API calls and can be easily scripted to protect new sites in a couple of minutes. Here are the four steps I'm going to run. First, I'm going to create a new version of the security configuration so we can protect the new website. The second, we will create a new security policy that protects against SQL injection attacks and will attach it to the new website. The third, we will indicate the scope of the protection by telling to apply to all URLs on that website. And the fourth step, will, we will activate the new version of the security policy in the staging. I'm going to run the four API calls using the application security CLI, which is included in the Akamai development environment. Note that I'm storing the values returned by API calls into shell variables to easily pass it to the next API call, which is something very common when automating tasks. Let's store the hostname I want to protect into an environment variable called my underscore hostname. So I don't have to type it later on. Let's use the echo command 
to verify my value is stored. All right, let's use the AppSec CLI to create a new version of our security configuration and save the version number into an environment variable. Next, we will create a new security policy by cloning a system policy that protects against SQL injection attacks and we'll attach it to the new website by referencing the variable we defined earlier. The following step is to indicate the scope of the protection by telling it to apply to all URLs as indicated with a slash following by a star. The last API call we are going to make is to activate the security configuration in the staging network. If we take a look at the parameters, we can see that I'm indicating the configuration version, my configuration ID, the network, some nodes, and also an email to get a confirmation. I can also make another API call to check the status and verify it's pending. Let me copy the new API call and paste it. And as you can see, it's activating. Next, let me go back to the web browser. I'm going to wait for a few seconds just to ensure the activation finishes and I'm going to type again the SQL injection and perfect. So now I get denied, which is what I was expected. You can see with a few API calls, I'm able to protect against SQL injection attacks. And with this, I'm going to pass it to Lucas, who is going to guide us on the last demo. Lucas, are you ready? Let's see now how Akamai Docker image can facilitate property development and local testing, as well as help automate Akamai-related tasks in CI-CD pipeline. My sample website was refactored and images changed to location. This needs to be reflected in Akamai configuration, otherwise images won't be cached. I will show you how such change can easily be done with Akamai pipeline, as well as locally tested using Akamai Sandbox before pushing the change to the repository. Afterwards, you will see how the change is automatically picked up by Jenkins and pushed eventually to Akamai network. In both cases, Akamai Docker image is heavily used to ease those tasks. You can see in my terminal two top-level folders, pipeline with source code of my property and Jenkins file, Sandboxes, used by Akamai Sandbox during local testing. Fix for image caching is already in my workspace. First, I added a separate rule for caching images and then included this rule in the main JSON file. I also added sample image URL to the test suite to ensure that it will be properly tested by the pipeline in Jenkins. I need to test this code before I push to the repository and will use Akamai Sandbox in Akamai Docker image for that task. Since multiple sandbox commands will be used, I will create long-running Docker container with all paths and config files mapped. Now I need to create a new sandbox for the property. Once the sandbox has been created, I'm gonna start it. Okay, let's check if sandbox is working and make a note of its identifier. It will be needed in future. At this point, the sandbox is using settings from the property with images not being cached. I can easily validate it by comparing XCheck cacheable response header for JavaScript asset versus image. We see that it's set to yes for the JavaScript and set to no for the image. Now I can build fixed config and deploy to the sandbox instance. If I test the same image URL, I see that the caching is enabled, which proves that the fix works as expected. The change can be committed to the repository. New commit triggers CI-CD pipeline in Jenkins. It executes similar tasks I've done in my terminal, like building the config, pushing to the network, and unit testing, but it's fully automated. Let's have a look how it was set up in the Jenkins file. Almost all stages and steps defined in the pipeline are executed inside Akamai Docker container. It gives access to all functionalities offered by Akamai CLIs. The sample implementation uses Akamai Pipeline CLI to build the config, Akamai Property CLI to deploy it to Akamai Network, Akamai Purge CLI to remove content from cache before testing. This unified way of using Akamai DevOps tools doesn't involve any additional dependency management since all is encapsulated in the image. 
Let's have a quick look back at the pipeline that's been running. Oh, great! It finished and all tests are green. The config is fully deployed and tested. I can inspect outputs from all the steps in order to get more details on the execution of each task. Like here, you see building JSON, creating new version of the property, activation on staging network, then purge, followed by unit testing. I hope you recognize URLs used in automated tests. I used the same for manual testing in Akamai Sandbox. OK, that's it. Passing the ball back to you, Javier. Thank you, Lucas. That was a great demo. I loved it. All right, let's do a recap of what we learned today. First, we started explaining the Akamai developer environment, what it contains, and how we created it using DevOps best practices. Then we show you how to provision API credentials, how to install the Docker desktop, and how you can run the Akamai Docker environment with a single command that works on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. And third, we show you four different demos on how you can leverage the tools included in the environment to automate things like invalidate content from the Akamai cache, enforce geofencing of media assets, protect the website against SQL injection attacks, and how to use a Jenkins pipeline to manage Akamai properties as code. We'll be sending out an email next week with the links to the recording, blog posts, and presentation, so you can review them at your own pace. The blog posts, we have links to all the code samples from the demos and give you access to other resources for further learning. We would like to extend also an invitation to help us make the Akamai Docker environment even better. Feel free to collaborate with us on GitHub and let us know if there is anything we could do to make the environment better for you. Of course, we also welcome pull requests.